This is an oral history interview with Senator Warren Rudman uh, for the Dole <coughs> Institute of Politics at the University of Kansas. We're in the Washington offices of Stonebridge International, and today is Wednesday, December 12, 2007, and I'm Brian Williams. Let's start with uh, some of your first thoughts about what you'd like to say about uh, Senator Dole. Well, I've known Bob Dole for a very long time. Uh, I knew him before I came to the Senate. Uh, I met him uh, while he was uh, campaigning with Jerry Ford uh, as his vice presidential nominee. Uh, I quickly came uh, to recognize that this was a very unique uh, Midwesterner, uh, somebody who had many traits that I admire, very direct, uh, not a lot of uh, fancy verbiage very easy to understand, extraordinarily patriotic, and someone who had overcome great disability uh, to get where he finally, finally arrived at. And he is a very special human being. And the more I got to know him, the more I came to respect him. And I was very close to Bob during my years in the Senate, and particularly when he ran for the presidency uh, against uh, President Bush. What was he like, sort of one-on-one, -on -one in private moments and so forth? Describe what it's like to be with him. You know, Bob Dole's public persona and private persona are, are quite similar. I've never understood uh, really the imbalance uh, that's been applied to him by the media on occasion that somehow depicted him as mean and gruff. Uh, oh yes, during campaigns, uh, particularly that uh, campaign with Jerry Ford, he could be pretty tough, but that was his job. But in person and, and really uh, as a leader, Bob Dole is a great listener, marvelous sense of humor, very direct, very understanding of someone's political needs, uh, uh, very realistic uh, and, and extraordinarily easy to talk to. A very relaxed guy to talk to. You don't sense any kind of internal strife going on with Bob Dole when you sit and talk to him. You're getting a kind of the heart of the Midwest, uh, a guy from Kansas who's never really changed very much. Some have said he tends to be somewhat impatient. Well, I think that's true of a lot of leaders. Uh, uh, yeah, I think Bob Dole is impatient. I think uh, Bob is very intellectually extraordinarily smart. He sees issues, all facets of the issues, very quickly. Uh, comes to fairly quick decisions on what he thinks is the proper path and doesn't have very much understanding of why it takes some people so long to make up their mind. I mean, particularly when he was the leader and he'd make a case to someone as to why they should support a particular legislative initiative, why they should vote either yes or no, and they would agonize and take so much time to do it. But that's foreign to Bob Dole. Bob Dole is a decision maker, and his whole life has been that way. And, uh, you know, I've tried to emulate that myself. In some, some people have described him as being very adept at not making decisions, but letting people sort of work things out uh, in his leadership role. Is that well, I think true? as a leader, I mean, I think he clearly pointed the direction he thought people ought to go. But he depended on a lot of other people who were very supportive of him, people like myself in various legislative initiatives to try to help move the ball forward. And he was never impatient in that sense. He understood the process took time. But when you finally get down to the point where the decision had to be made and people couldn't make it, I think that kind of got under his skin. Didn't show it a lot, but I could tell because I know him so well. And was he more a conciliator or did he have a very strong set of values and objectives? Well, I think both. I, I think Bob Dole had, a, had and has a very strong set of personal values, political objectives, knows who he is, knows what he believes, doesn't have to stop and think on an issue where he's going to come out on it. I mean, he inherently understands where he is on issues. Uh, but on the other hand, he fully understands that others may not uh, quite have the sense uh, of who they are, uh, may not have the deeply embedded values that Bob Dole has, very understanding of that, and not impatient about that at all, and understood other people's political needs, people who found themselves in a terrible political crunch where they really wanted to support something, but it might cause them dire political consequences. Bob understood that. I mean, Bob didn't ask people to do things that were going to commit political suicide. 
How does that uh, conform with what appeared to be a problem in his presidential races of not having a real clear cut image of what he, a platform? I think that Bob's 88 race, in my humble opinion, and I was with him right alongside him on some very famous occasions, including the night in the studio where in New Hampshire where he was talking from a hotel room to George Bush in another hotel room, a hotel room and said to Tom Brokaw, who asked him, would you like to say something to the, to, to the vice president? He said, yes, yeah, stop lying about my record. And I was right there when that happened. So, uh, so I, uh, you know, I, I, understand, uh, I understand him pretty well. I go back a long way with him. Uh, and uh, in 88, it seems to me that the campaign organization and the consultants took control of Bob Dole, and you know, he is guilty of allowing them to take control. He never really emerged as the Bob Dole that I have known during that campaign. I mean, Bob Dole didn't really need a lot of managers to tell him what to say and what he believed and how to put it forth. But you know, the same thing has happened to a lot of other candidates. Uh, who suddenly became people who were very different uh, than, than, than I knew them. And I think a great example of that would be, would be Vice President Al Gore, who has since gone on to you know, win a Nobel Prize and, and an Emmy and has done incredible work and has been extraordinarily attractive and popular. But boy, when he ran against George uh, W. Bush in 2000, you would not have thought it was the same human being. And I have the same feeling about Bob Dole in 88. I mean, I think that he allowed himself to become a captive of a campaign and the management that really didn't understand him or his style. That's what I think. Were you at all associated with his short uh, <clears throat> campaign for president in 1980? Well, I was running myself in 1980 for the Senate, so I knew him, of course, and observed him and Howard Baker and John Connolly and Ronald Reagan and George Bush and <laughs> many others, but not very close to him during that. Are there any things about the 88 campaign, uh, you've already mentioned the stop line about my record, other really memorable occasions or thoughts you have about that campaign? Well, the most memorable occasion to me is the one I've just described to you, I mean, and, uh, you know, it, it really was, uh, you know, example of dishonest campaigning, I mean, uh, and Bob had won the Kansas caucuses, he came to New Hampshire doing well, and they decided to knock him down by putting the label of tax raiser around his neck, when the fact is, what he was supporting with the tax increases proposed by the Reagan administration of which George Bush was vice president and I mean it was it was very disingenuous and uh, the ineptitude of the Dole campaign and able to turn that around quickly and come back at them before that fatal weekend where we were unable to produce a commercial to do it that sealed his fate in New Hampshire had that gone differently Bob Dole well might have been president of the United States and what kind of a president would he be? I've been a wonderful president. I mean, Bob Dole, number one, in the area of domestic policy, really understands uh, America and in many ways is quite moderate. In some ways, I would even say liberal uh, as it deals with people who really have got the short end of the stick in society. I mean, his devotion to people who are disabled, to people who are poor, the people don't have enough to eat. I mean, that is reflected in his legislative program. These are hardly the initiatives of a flinty, tight-fisted, right-wing conservative Republican. But in the area of foreign policy and defense policy, you know, those of us who have had the fortune or misfortune in our lives to see combat, to be wounded, to see people we care about killed next to us, tend to have a rather conservative approach to committing U.S. forces. And I think Bob Dole has always been one who would think long and hard before committing U.S. forces. If you had to, in the national interest, he wouldn't hesitate. But he would have been an excellent commander-in-chief who really understood the plight of the average soldier. We've been talking about him as a presidential candidate so far. Uh, what are some of your outstanding memories of him in the Senate? My memories of Bob Dole are really, there are three kinds of memories. One when we would be in our party caucuses, all of the Republicans with Bob Dole trying to sort our way through how the Senate Republicans would take a stand on a particular issue. And that was fascinating, to watch him 
like the conductor of a large orchestra deal with with 50 some odd or 40 some odd very different individuals with very different agendas an attempt to to try to bring this mass together. Somebody said leading the Senate was a little bit like herding cats, although herding cats might be easier. And there's some truth to that. that that's one memory. Second memory is his actions on the floor. He tried very hard to work well with Democratic leaders. And I saw that. He, you know, particularly his working with George Mitchell. They, they had great regard for one another. Ended up practicing law together for a while afterwards. Uh, they were fierce partisans, but extraordinarily respectful and honorable in their actions towards each other. And I do remember the occasions where people got under Bob Dole's skin uh, on the floor of the Senate, and, and, and he would be quite able uh, to, in his wonderful way, put somebody down with a quick one-liner, a self-deprecating story. I mean, and. When Bob Dole decided to speak on the floor, people generally listened because normally it was a mixture of, of, of tough talk and being extraordinarily funny. I mean, Bob Dole could convulse the Senate in laughter with that wonderful dry sense of wit and humor. The third thing when I think about Bob Dole is our personal relationships. Uh, you know, he, uh, he did something extraordinary with, with me. Uh, I, I was still a freshman. And he named me the ranking Republican in the Iran-Contra Committee because he knew my background as Attorney General of New Hampshire and all the investigations I had done probably offered me better than most for that. I became vice chairman of that because the Democratic chairman, Dan Inouye, uh, who was a close friend, decided he didn't want a ranking member. He wanted a, a, a vice chairman, treated me pretty much as a co-chairman. You know, and, and Bob told me why he did that. He took a lot of flack from some senior Republicans who wanted that high visibility post, people who might be aspiring to the presidency. I certainly wasn't, uh, and, and, and how he outlined why he wanted me to do it and what he wanted me to do and how he thought I ought to do it, but essentially said, you know, you'll have to make those decisions yourself. I'm not going to interfere in what you do. And then the same as he, when he made me chairman of the Ethics Committee, and a job I really didn't want, but he said I had to take. He said, you must do this for me. I need someone who I can trust, who will be fair and, and nonpartisan, and, and that committee is very important. It deals with the most sensitive subjects and how we talked about that. And during some of the very tough investigations, like the Keating Five, I would brief Bob Dole on what was going on, as any other committee chairman would. And I must say that never once did he attend to inject any political aspect any political facet into either Iran-Contra uh, or uh, certainly uh, into the whole Keating Five. So those are the contexts in which I came to realize his values, his integrity. This was truly a man of great stature, towering integrity, true patriot, special guy, great friend. The Iran-Contra <clears throat> was an instance where he was really, in a sense, put in between serving the, his president and serving the truth. Was that difficult, do you think, for him? I don't think so. I remember very clearly uh, sitting with Bob uh, on a winter morning. I flew back from the Christmas recess when that whole story broke, and he had named said, I want to see you, and he named me before he even called me that night, named me that morning. I came in that afternoon, sat in his office, that beautiful office overlooking the, the mall, and we talked a bit, and we talked about the precedent, which of course was Watergate, and I said, you know, Bob, uh, my feeling about this, I mean, I don't know what the facts are, but from the allegations, we've got a real constitutional crisis here, and, uh, you know, I am a Republican, but, you know, my oath is not to the Republican Party, it's the Constitution, and, you know, I may have to say and do some hard things. And he looked at me and he said, you do, you do what you think is right for the country. I'll never forget that. He looked me around and he said, Warren, you do what you think is right for the country. That's what I want you to do. And I said, well, on that basis, I'm glad to do it. And he never, ever departed from that. I think he was unhappy with some of the things I did, but he never said so. In relationship to Iran consciousness? Yeah, I mean, I was kind of tough on some people. Uh, and a lot of the Republicans thought I was tougher than I had to be, but some of them were, frankly, lying through their teeth. And I am an old prosecutor with a lot of experience examining witnesses, and I was going to let them get away with it. And Bob understood that, but, I mean, it made it a little uncomfortable for, for the president, I'm sure. On the other hand, Bob recognized that by exposing some of these people what they were, I was helping the president, who really was not knowledgeable of many of the things that were being done in his name. 
And Bob understood that. Bob is very smart. Bob understands. Do you ever think <clears throat> that uh, maybe you didn't get all the story of Iran Contra? No, I think we got it all. And the books that have come out since have indicated that we got it all. Uh, there is no question in my mind that no one ever told Ronald Reagan that they were trading uh, essentially arms for hostages. And there's no doubt in my mind that no one ever told Ronald Reagan that they were taking proceeds from the sale of some of these weapons and giving them to the Contras in contravention of a number of U.S. laws. I am absolutely convinced that Reagan did not know that. And his diaries, which we were privileged to look at, and all of the information we got from the White House and all of the electronic traffic, no indication of it, and I believe we found out the real story. I guess uh, it's more with uh, George Herbert Walker Bush that uh, questions may, may linger. That be true? I always thought he got an unfair rap on that, too. When I think he said he was out of the loop, that's not a very artful way to put it. He was the vice president, but he may have been he may be in the loop, but there were certain bypasses when it came to information. Uh, I don't think George Bush had any idea what was going on with that. Um, <clears throat> in your book, uh, which covered pretty thoroughly your senatorial career, I would, I would think, probably what you set out to do. And well, it was interesting. Uh, one of the people at the Library of Congress told me nobody ever written a book quite like it who was an insider because essentially, as you recall from reading the book, it, it, it takes the four responsibilities of the Senate. Three are given by legislation, one by the U.S. Supreme Court, to advise and consent, to legislate, to control the ethics of the members. Those are all in the Constitution. And the advise and consent, the legislation, the ethics, the fourth oversight, Iran Contra, uh, that was given by the Supreme Court in the 1800s when a president objected to the Senate, how dare you investigate the executive branch to come? And the Congress said, wait a minute, we have every right to, and the Supreme Court decided that they did. And that book essentially covers those four responsibilities with an insider's look. And the people that enjoyed it the most were the people who covered it, the members of the press who bought the book or I gave the book to and they read it. They said, you know, we, we never knew that. We never could quite figure that out. And, and uh, so the book was very candid. It, it was not a, a political document. It was a factual document. And it was published in 96. That is correct. So now we're 12 or so years beyond that. Have you thought of, oh, I wish I could, any reconsiderations about what you said in the book? No, as a matter of fact, I, I'm kind of pleased with the last chapter in which I predicted unless the Republican Party was a little more careful with what it did and didn't get so involved with the Christian right uh, uh, that it would eventually do itself grave harm and that's exactly what's happened and this coming election I'm sorry to say is have to prove that once more no I, I think the book was prescient in some ways how do you imagine uh, Bob Dole will be remembered in 20 years, or should be remembered? Oh, he, uh, Bob Dole will be remembered for a long time, and what you're doing at the University of Kansas is a wonderful uh, thing to do. Bob Dole will be remembered, I think, for uh, a number of things and in order of priority. He'll be remembered as a great American patriot who fought for the country, savagely wounded, savagely wounded, difficult recovery, determined to make something of his life, came to Congress, did extraordinarily well in the Congress, came to the Senate, rose to the top very quickly, uh, was a man who had integrity, who had ethics, who had great personal values, who contributed uh, greatly uh, to the Senate during the years that he was in the leadership and also chaired the Finance Committee and will long be remembered as someone who put the country ahead of his personal interests. That's how I think Bob Doe will be remembered and the project that you're working on will help do that. remember one witty remark of Bob Dole, which I'm sure he used a number of occasions, but I heard it once, I believe it was on the floor of the Senate when there was some discussion about the House and the Senate and something going on. And Bob, in that very laconic, dry way, you know, kind of looking off into the space and not addressing anybody in particular, said, you know, he said, uh, I served a number of years in the House, 
and of course I was elected to the Senate. And the day that I left the House, it improved both bodies. And it just cracked everybody up. And there are numerous instances. Bob's best humor is self-deprecating. And he is, a, he is a marvel at making fun of himself and not taking himself too seriously. And uh, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a marvel to watch. How important do you think that is for a politician? Oh, it's very important. I think having wit and particularly self-deprecating wit, I think it, it conveys to, the, to the, your constituency, in Bob's case, a national constituency, and to his colleagues, two things. Number one, that the man understands that there has to be a little humor in life, that life can't all be deadly serious. And number two, he doesn't always take himself seriously, that he tends to make fun of himself. And those are, that's a great trait. Not many of us have it, but he does. And I suppose laughter is also a way to share humanity. You know? There's no question, and there is a lot of humanity in Bob Dole. <coughs> I, I have vivid memories of Bob Dole on the floor of the Senate during the debate for the Americans with Disabilities Act. Standing there, enormously disabled personally, looking across the aisle to Dan Inouye, who you know spent time together in hospitals, also severely disabled. Neither one of them would ever say they were disabled, but talking about people in America who have crippling disabilities, who need the help of their fellow man and their government. I've heard him speak about the food stamp program and what it does for poor people who are hungry. And then I go back and I look at Bob Dole's life growing up in Russell, Kansas, uh, recognizing that he was not a son of a wealthy family and how hard things must have been back at that time in Kansas. And it is not surprising that he has a broad streak of humanity running through him to help people who are less fortunate than he is. No question that's true. Did you uh, share any Codells with him? Did you do any travel? I did. Uh, I don't recall exactly which ones, but several. Yeah. Okay. Not the one to China? No, I didn't make that trip, no. Okay. Good. All right.